the part two of the human support for long duration space missions session. This session is organized by the Aerospace Architecture Subcommittee of the AAA Design Engineering Technical Committee. And um, we have some brochures around for it. If you're interested in finding out more about the technical committee, uh, somewhere, we'll, we'll find them. And uh, this is the, in this session, we have uh, first Bill Meyer, and then we have a half hour gap, unfortunately, because Tina Henriette couldn't make it from Copenhagen, didn't finish the paper. And then uh, we have uh, our third speaker. Um, Alfredo. Alfredo, Alfredo Zelosi, yeah. And uh, then we'll have a half hour uh, panel discussion of the authors who were in the human support sessions yesterday and today. And I got to try out my new spotlight. <laughs> okay, so uh, Bill Meyer is the former director of Network and Technology Services at the New School for Social Research in New York City. He's held positions at other uh, colleges and at a, at a hospital. He holds a degree in psychology and a master's in interactive telecommunications from New York University. He's founder of Interactivity Consultants, and he spent years researching and developing and testing a telepathic communication system. Does anybody maybe get the lights a little bit in the back? between the astronauts and crews on the ground. But 
And although I, I think the research is important and we have to do something, it's still a very, very, very different environment than what people are going to be experiencing if, again, if, if the group is completely isolated. And, and, and in a situation where their life is really at risk. I believe that virtual environments may provide at least one of the countermeasures. You read the research, they talk about the countermeasures being required, but the question is, well, what would countermeasures be? So if, if, as I believe, emotions can be transmitted through this kind of media in some way, that may be helpful. So the thing I make this statement is there's been research on emotional contagion. Emotional contagion is where one person catches somebody else's emotion. You, you see this happen in large groups, perhaps at a, at a stadium, where all of a sudden a whole group emotion occurs. You also see this interpersonally with somebody who is uh, crying in your presence, or laughing, and you begin to feel happy or sad. The, the, the newest research on emotional contagion however, shows that this effect can happen unconsciously. And the, the particular study that, that Newman and Strack did involved having people listen to a neutral, I think it was philosophical text being read to them, so that the text didn't contain any emotional content. And they believed, that the, the subjects believed that they would be tested at the end for the, for, for <coughs> the comprehension of that text. In reality, the test that they were taking after they, they heard the text was going to test for their emotions. So the, the question is the they worded. And the, the voice of the text being read to them was either slightly sad or slightly happy, but not so much so that if somebody listening to it would necessarily even key into that. And it turns out that, that in, the, in the subsequent testing, that the people who heard the text read in a slightly sad voice became sadder. The people who heard the, te the text read in a slightly happy voice became happier. So there's definitely a, a emotional contagion effect that can happen unconsciously, and the mechanism, mechanisms of how this happens are as yet under, 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 not completely understood. So, what we're going to talk about is that this virtual interactions may be able to exploit this particular effect. Now, emotional states are recognizable to computers through biometric measures. So at MIT, Picard, Vizas, and Healy got an 81% accuracy in detecting from eight different emotions uh, using just four biometric measures, and I believe it was uh, blood pressure, skin conductance, a general measure of facial tension and respiration rate. And on that alone, a computer was, was picking from eight emotions and somebody was, was modeling. Uh, I believe that if you, if, you, if, you, if you can provide the same information to another person in some kind of physical way, not in a data display that they're looking at, but something that they're actually feeling, that you may be able to determine what somebody else's emotion is. And you may be able to actually begin to feel that emotion. And I think that we all sort of have experienced the intimate contact. This is, in a sense, what happens. But, but that may be able to be abstracted from that situation. So the specific system that I've developed, I, I refer to as closed eyes telehaptic communication. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about haptics in a minute. But it's, it, can two people sitting still with eyes closed interact remotely? That was the, the design problem that I had set out to solve. This new form of physical communication may transmit emotions and help mitigate dysphoria. And then finally, I'm going to discuss the, the, the steps where research needs to go. So haptics <coughs> is a term that people may or may not be familiar with, so I'll explain it. If, if, if you are involved in computer gaming, I'm going to date myself now, but if you went to Disneyland for, I think it was the, the rocket to the moon, there was a vibration you would feel in the seat. Anytime a computer is in some way creating a physical sensation, that is the realm of happiness. Uh, it's also used in telesurgery, so that a, a surgeon can feel what is happening remotely on, on somebody's body. There are two general immersive VR approaches. Most people are only familiar with the, the holodeck idea, something that's, that's completely all-encompassing, that's very stimulating, very visual and trying to recreate some typical waking experience, or, or some fantastic waking experience, but nonetheless, it's an externally focused experience. In, in a low sensory immersive VR approach, which is what 
what we've been talking about, it lends itself much more to inward focused experiences, to, to, uh, to, to, to being in touch with what is going on in one's own body and emotional state. And in the case of uh, the type of system that I've developed in, in what's going on for another person in a similar way, haptic output becomes very important because one of the design constraints that I believe is important is that you should be able to close your eyes. So, uh, we've already talked a little bit about this, so we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so, so closed eyes, telehaptic communication, sending sensations over a network. The system here is multimodal in that it uses two senses. So you're gonna, you'll see how somebody can sense another person's presence through physical sensations as well as the sound, and those are in your So you'll feel something that feels like it's coming from here, and you'll hear something that sounds like it's coming from here. And that makes it have a much more real sense. Uh, this may provide me here for more than one occasion. And it's, it's, it's not, it, it doesn't interfere with the process of relaxation training exercises or, or any, any other type of communication that might be developed that is internally focused, not, not something that normally two people would be able to do. So this is the, the pair of prototypes that I tested. And you'll see that there's, there's a helmet. The helmet contains eight vibrators that circle the head. There's a waistband that contains also eight equally spaced vibrators circling the waist. Headphones, a fingertip heart rate monitor, and a elastic band that goes around the chest to sense feeling. So this is a diagram of the system. This is in the handouts, so you don't worry too much about getting everything on there. But basically, if you're looking here, we've got these the, the yellow triangles around here are, are representing the vibrators that are in the waist. The blue triangles are representing the vibrators that are in the helmet. And you'll see this will become clearer in a moment when I show you now. Where it says inflammation sensor there, that, that, that red circle with the, with, the, with the beige nose in front is actually what's called an avatar. That's the, the representation of a person in a virtual space. So when we look at a schematic, you're going to see two avatars, which are really the two people in the virtual space. This is the waistband that has eight vibrators in it. Okay, so this is a map that each user who is using the system can look at if they so choose. I, I encourage people when they're using the system to close their eyes, but in the very beginning, it's important to, to, to orient yourself. <coughs> so if we're looking here, oops, okay, this, this yellow arrow here is showing which vibrators on it that have the weights. So what happens is the system has picked up your heartbeat, and you feel your heartbeat as coming from the center of the space. So with your eyes closed, you feel a beating coming. If you, if you in a virtual space, turn around, you feel a beating coming from behind. That's felt at your waist. You also hear your own breath uh, as two musical notes. Now, the, the other individual is here in the virtual space. And notice this, this shows that the front vibrators on the helmet beating with that person's heart. And again, in the video that you'll see in a minute, you'll see that each one of these two avatars is flashes, and that's with a heartbeat. So the other important thing here is that this entire interaction is, is completely observable by a third party. And uh, so the individuals can see it, but again, it can be recorded, it's all digital data, it can be replayed exactly as it occurred. These, these, these blue rings here will expand as the individual inhales and they contract as the individual exhales. So once again, before I go to the, to the video, there's a little bit of an abstract concept to get. If, if you and I are interacting in the space, we're each wearing the system, I am feeling your heartbeat when you're in front of me in the space. If I turn around, I feel your heartbeat coming from behind, and I hear your breathing, which also will, will have the, the illusions of coming from behind, because it pans right and left again with that vibration. So that further here when we get to this slide. So this is two people using the system. Now the, the sounds that you're hearing, the staccato sounds, are from the back of us. Here's the first one.
inclination sensor for the head. So your, one's head becomes like a joystick. So if you tilt your head forward, you move forward in space. If you tilt your head backwards, you move backward, right? And you can rotate in space, all through a very, very subtle head movement, which again, it was designed to be as, as unobtrusive as possible to use with. So you're actually contact the, the, the wall in the virtual space. So again, this is just one, one possible virtual environment. It was designed very simply because it's something that these two people had to imagine, essentially. You can look at it, but it's, it's, it's an environment that you're imagining. The, feature, uh, the features of the system are that everything that goes on, everything that passes across the network is completely symbolic of digital data. Very low bandwidth. So if you're inhaling, a one gets sent across the network. If you exhale, a two gets sent across the network. If you hold your breath, a three. A heartbeat, again, is just a bite of information. As people move in the space, information about their position gets sent across the network. If somebody doesn't move, almost nothing is passing, which is why this is the work over dialogue mode. Again, it's, it's uh, I think it's Claude Shannon, but information theory, uh, it's called the difference that makes a difference. It's, it's only sending what actually is relevant. Interactions are observable by third parties, can be replayed and re-experienced. So a, a third party individual could be wearing a system and feeling what either one of the users is feeling as they're, as they're feeling it. An astronaut could replay an interaction that uh, he or she is having with a spouse. And these recorded interactions can be analyzed for useful patterns. So as if we, if we found, for instance, that you know, people were, were having particular interactions, they tended to feel better, Those, the, the, the raw data can simply be looked at for patterns. And then people can, can put this on and then feel, OK, what did they do? So that, so that you can begin to, to focus in on, on interactions that are, are, are helpful for, for the desired effect. OK, so th this particular slide I've got up here I thought was fascinating. This is the very first picture of the Earth and the Moon from another planet. This, is, this was taken, I think it was the 8th of May, from the, the Mars quarter. Uh, I want to give you now a user scenario. So let's, let's imagine there's an astronaut on a spacecraft. His wife is on, back on, on Earth. And there's a 10-minute communication delay. They each put the system on. They, 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 they send emails. They've arranged to have this time together. The, the, the wife on Earth, let's say it's at 10 PM, looks up towards Mars. The, the astronaut is looking down towards Earth. And they know that in exactly 10 minutes, they're going to feel each other's presence arriving. And they may engage in some type of a, 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 a ritual that has some cultural significance to them. But in, 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 any, in any sense, I think the important thing to remember is that this astronaut wonders what kind of connection are, are they losing, perhaps, with a, with a, with a spouse or a loved one back on Earth has a time that they know was, was intimate, it was focused. And then, then as, the, as the, the, the presence of that person arrives in this virtual space, although you can't have a conversation or an immediate pushback. You can move around the person, you can feel their heartbeat, hear their respiration, and any other biometric information that, that, that you want to provide across the system. User testing of the system was done with, first off, to just make sure people had a, a reason to use this thing, because it's a very unusual kind of experience in the beginning. Recorded the post interaction discussion and collected data so the normal search. What I used was the profile of mood states, and it, it has six major emotional factors that it measures. And this, I, I actually picked this test because this is what I see was used in, in Canis's research. It seems to be used a lot. It's very negatively focused. I mean, that was, a, that was definitely feedback that I got from people. And it's not measuring for any happy emotions. The closest thing is bigger activity. But what happened was users in the system were, were uh, asked to model one of these six emotions. So, the one that we flipped a coin, one person picked one of six envelopes that had one of these six emotions in it. The, the two partners <coughs> went to their separate rooms in the system, and then out of my view, the envelope was open. 
the, the, in, in this case, I'll specifically talk about, um, about where somebody picked tension anxiety. And I didn't know what they picked. She closed it back up, put it back in the envelope. At the end of the interaction, which went on for 15 minutes, the, uh, the husband was asked to rate what, which of these things he thought that his wife was, was, you know, was emoting. And she had been instructed to recall some emotion where that was gone, or some, some time where that emotion was gone. With. And it turns out that, again, she had picked tension anxiety. He picked up tension anxiety on a, and rated it on a scale of 0 to 4 as 4, which was you know, very helpful in the beginning. And then, and then what was even more amazing was in the, in the actual discussion, it turned out that she had been remembering some car accident that had happened eight months before. She hadn't been injured, but it was, you know, it was not a fun experience. And he, he felt that she was remembering that exact experience. So that was pretty significant. That was the most significant of what happened in the trials. But in all cases, people felt a very strong sense of each other's presence. The, the average user rating of people were asked, well, if on a, on a scale of zero, which is nothing, one, which would be like an email, all the way up to four, which is like sitting next to somebody you care about on the couch, uh, people rated this on average as 2.85. Experience was engaging. And, and the experience needs to be repeated. It's, it's, it's an abstract situation. Like any, uh, any new environment or intimate communication over time, people develop, I think, their own language, but that's what needs to be explored further. So the next step in research is a larger user population in the trials, testing for more positive emotions. Uh, user testing where one partner is perhaps in an expeditionary environment, either up on the International Space Station, in Antarctica, <coughs> or some remote area where, they, where, where the system doesn't have a purpose. And, and also as a treatment modality, perhaps for depression, seeing if, if, you know, if, if one person's mood can actually pick somebody else's up. So I think we've already sort of talked about all of these observations and conclusions, but again, uh, with the, the fur further study on the system is more important. I definitely believe that, and at this point, I'm, I'm you know, seeking funding to see how that can go on. So, again, coming back to our original question, can one person's mood be improved by a remote, non-verbal communication, a communication with a loved one who's not physically present? I think there's a lot of reason to believe that it can. Okay, like if anybody, I don't know if I have time left, but if there's any questions, I'll be happy to. Why did you choose to expand to the intersection of the heart and rather than a chance to raise yourself in touch with the other person's heart? You know, I have to say that a lot of these decisions were arbitrary because it was just necessary to, to sort of to, to prove the concept that it could be done. But the, the, the thing about a system like this is that, what you're, that, that any, any connection is possible. So, and that really is why I believe more testing is required to see what, you know, what would work. A lot of these decisions were simply made because you know, it, was, it was convenient for the law to call a prototype to be designed. But uh, there's absolutely no reason that if, that, and also, you know, you can, you can create experiences of synesthesia. There's no reason that, that you know, one sense can't be transmitted to another. And you can easily set this up so users could, could just play around with it and decide what works best for a particular couple. Well, that brings up the question, if you can record these experiences, <coughs> How does one recognize that the person on the other end of the telemetry is the need one spouse? You, you know, there is no way. I mean, unless you're looking at some kind of a video feed in real time, uh, I mean, could somebody, could, you know, could somebody fake you out, kind of? Or, or well, yeah, this? Your, your wife's really sick and somebody else stands in for it for a while. Well, you wouldn't be able to know that. Although, if you know, I, I think if people were using this system, which I think would be important, let's take the example of an astronaut and spouse, on Earth before the mission even happened, so they gain some comfort with it. Much like, you know, if, if you know if you're if you're in some kind of intimate situation with your partner and your eyes are closed and somebody else gets put in, you you probably would feel the difference. Just just in terms of the, of the style of relating. And it's interesting to note that one thing that, you know, I'll tell you anecdotally, the people who use the system, in almost all cases, when I was you know, in a discussion afterward, they were talking about how the way they moved, something happened, it was, it was like, oh, you do that all the time. You know, it, it was, there was a clearly some style of relating that was not apparent to me, but that was apparent to the two individuals in the system. So that is the best way to answer that. Yeah. 
I'm just curious, uh, have you done this with more than two people? Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the testing that was done, the, the formal testing I did was with five couples. No, I mean, as far at one time, like family? <clears throat> well, the, four of the couples were married, and one of the couples, uh, one of the couples was uh, an adult daughter and mother. And the interesting thing to note there is the adult daughter and, and, and mother, the, the daughter was very motivated to sort of try this out originally, had, had hated it. You know, just, just said, no, it was very boring. The mother rated a very high sense of the daughter's presence. The daughter rated no sense of the mother's presence. And I, and this, this is my interpretation, but, but I felt that maybe the experience was actually a little bit too intimate, you know, for that relationship. And I say this because when I had, when I had presented the system at, at New York University, where a lot of people used it, but just, but only once, you know, maybe five or 10 minutes. Again, I had a, a, a daughter and a father who interacted. It was a, at that time a classmate of mine, and she was, thought it was a, a, quite an interesting experience and said, and her, her, I think her words were that it was creepy when you know, doing it with her dad. <coughs> so, um, so again, more testing you know, to see what, what you know, there may be other types of interactions that would be more appropriate to, you know, maybe you don't want to feel your, your dad's heartbeat and breath, you know, maybe there's something else that, that you know, is, is, is more appropriate. Yeah. Just a comment, it just it strikes me that this also has usage of therapeutic modality, you know, too, the terrestrial applications as well as the expeditionary environmental applications. Well, to, to comment on that, before this, um, before I even had thought about applying this to, to, to an extraterrestrial, terrestrial communication, almost the, the, the most frequent comment that came up, with, there were two comments that came up with people using the system. The one was people thought, oh, it's great. Uh, sex thing for the internet. I, mean, I think that comes from the vibrators. And when I would challenge people to say, well, how would that go? They usually couldn't, 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 couldn't actually come up with something. And actually, I think for that application, it wouldn't work. I think it would be very empty. Uh, but the, the second most common comment for people is couples counseling. You know, people immediately have a sense that this, because you know, immediately talk is removed, you have to have some kind of a relationship with another person. and. You either have it or you don't, you know, but then frequently that is a problem between couples. So I agree with that. And, and again, that's something, you know, that I know the area where perhaps this is why I have an issue and I think should be research. Okay, thank you very much. We will return to the recording. We roll it. So, our, our next speaker is Alfredo Zelosi. Alfredo holds a diploma in industrial electronics and, and doctorate in electronic and electrical engineering from the University of Pisa. He has been professor of naval automation at the Nautical College of Livorno and served as consultant for Bell and Howell in Pasadena on high density magnetic recording. And we've also consulted for McDonnell Douglas and Yardley Corporation. He, since 19, in 1986, he founded the company. Kaiser Italia in Livorno, which he is president. He has participated in 28 space missions and 19 payloads, both by his company for the Italian Space Agency and European Space Agency, which have flown on both Russian and American spacecraft. The core business of his company is microgravity experiments, particularly life science. Belfredo is the principal investigator on the upper limit of postural research in space. Thank you, Mike. Uh, what you see here is the uh, sticker, the logo of the mission, which is uh, actually well, in execution uh, on the International Space Station. Uh, it represents, it is taken from the uh, creation of Adam from uh, the Sistine Chapel in Rome. And uh, on the right is the hand of God giving life to the hand of God. Uh, the reason we choose this logo is uh, evident from the use of the hands and from the other side is going to represent the Italian workmanship and uh, uh, the Italian art as well. <coughs> well uh, <coughs> I'm going to tell you something concerning the experiments on human upper that we are executing. Uh, 
for the astronauts, of course. Um, when my kid was uh, young, it was a long time ago, uh, I remember one day he asked me, Dad, why uh, Christopher Colombo went to America? And uh, I said, we know all the, uh, the stories, the, uh, the hero, the, uh, navig the great navigator, he wanted to discover new lands. Uh, I gave to my kid another answer. I told him uh, Christopher Colombo went to America because at, at this time there was no refrigerator. And he said, wow, what are you telling me? What are you telling me? <laughs> and uh, I explained to him that uh, at that time, if you want to preserve the food, you need spices or salt, no other way. And so Christopher Colombo went to America, came here, because he was looking for spices, because it was of incredible value for that economy. Uh, <clears throat> This means that uh, when we are doing things, especially in space, uh, we are looking for uh, some specific application. But then uh, what we get is a lot of return in different fields. And uh, this is particularly true in life science. Uh, when we use an astronaut as a test subject, uh, well, we are looking for uh, some results that we can get. Uh, we are looking for uh, his particular situation in absence of gravity. Uh, but, uh, well, we are looking in, uh, to how to uh, apply countermeasures in order that his life on board is uh, better. But at the same time, we are looking, and this is the main goal, we are looking on uh, to how the protocols, the countermeasures, the scientific return can be used and applied for most of the people here on the earth. Just think about the bone box. Bone box. Okay? If you if we know that 1.5% uh, of bone is lost for each month of microgravity. So after one year, an astronaut is losing nearly more than 10%, around 15% of his uh, culture. And this, is, this has an incredible impact. Now, if we are able to understand the, the, the effects, the causes, the mechanism, and the countermeasure, we will solve an enormous problem here on the Earth, osteoporosis, which affects well, all the favorite population of over 50, but, uh, well, let's say more than half of, of the air population. So, uh, this is why life science is taken in uh, so great consideration in uh, experiments in space. So if we look to uh, the uh, Mars mission, uh, of course in the Mars mission this uh, problem will be, um, will be amplified because we know that uh, it takes three years going and coming back. And uh, this cannot be afforded. We can study mission profiles, uh, uh, life support system, everything we like, but if we do not solve this problem of bone loss, no way. It is not possible to go there and come back safely. The return to Earth will be a disaster for, uh, for the astronauts. So, uh, there are a, a, a many different uh, uh, evidences of uh, problems that are affect affecting the astronauts on, on orbit. Uh, among them, I will uh, record the cardiovascular decondition. Uh, we know that all the fluids in the body tends to move upward, toward the head. And so we have that very strange photos of astronauts with red, red face. Uh, they seem to, to, to 
be fat, and they have head edges, and uh, then they have disorientation. One of the classic phenomena is very close to the, uh, this, the uh, it is called the SOPI subsyndrome. Uh, it, it's uh, a phenomena like a uh, uh, Marcament, a space motion sickness. And uh, the astronauts feel uh, fibers and uh, uh, they are not uh, familiar with people. So, so uh, this is a, a, a classic uh, phenomenon found especially during the, the beginning of the, of the space mission. Then, uh, as I said, we have uh, loss of culture. And this is due to a strange effect of two counteracting cells, osteoblast and osteoclast. And they are normally working in our, in our body. One is bringing calcium to the bones, and the other one is removing calcium from the bones in order to reconstruct. Uh, what happens? These cells are sensible to gravity. And so uh, the result is that osteoclasts win, and they remove the calcium. So the effect is that uh, our bones are uh, weakening, and another important effect is that we are diffusing calcium into our body. And this implies a change in the electrolytic composition. And at the end, we have uh, renal stone formation. So uh, there, are, um, the, there is a sequence of events that start from a microgravity condition and then have influence on our then uh, we have disorientation, we have altered the proprioception, uh, how we perceive the, the environment where we are, and muscular discoordination. Just to remind one point, if I, if I try to launch a ball, it is normal for me to launch the ball in this way, and for you to pick up in this way. Uh, this is normal, because our um, um, motor control system, which is in our brain, has to learn in this way. But in space, it's not in this way. If I launch a ball, it, 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 it goes straight. And so uh, if I have to receive it, I have to think in a different manner. But uh, the activity, catch the ball from my brain, starts a motor control program in my arm, which tell to, my, to the muscles in my arm to move in a certain sequence, which is in this way. So. Uh, in space, we have to readapt our motor control system. <clears throat> so, at the end, all these effects uh, have uh, an impact on the uh, life of the astronaut. Uh, so, uh, why we concentrate on upper limb? Because upper limb is uh, the main, uh, uh, it, it's the locomotor medium. For the astronaut. They do not move uh, with, the, with the feet, they move with the hands in this way. So uh, the upper limb is particularly important in this respect, and we can get a lot of information on the motor control and on the, on the uh, muscle and force. <clears throat> we have uh, the, the grasping act of uh, grasping an object, which is, which is a very complex uh, uh, system and uh, implies uh, coordination between sensory motor function uh, and uh, biomechanical uh, construction. So uh, this is another reason why upper limb is used. Well, so in frame of uh, the Italian Space Agency and NASA agreement for the uh, use, for the utilization of the International Space Station, uh, our company developed the AHPA facility hand posture analyzer facility, dedicated to study on uh, The facility has been delivered, it's been delivered to NASA, and uh, uh, on 29 August this year, it went uh, with a progress P12 to the station, and has been, has been operated by at new last week, with 100% success. And uh, Ed will repeat the, the protocols 
and uh, my form, which will go to the station as uh, uh, expedition A, uh, will contain during this stay the repetition of the protocols. On, uh, on the <coughs> so the, the, the main focus of a hand post analyzer is in the general understanding of the neurophysiologic mechanism of the reaching, grasping, and launching. Uh, uh, especially looking to the motor control uh, system during normal and under gravity condition. And the other point is the assessment of muscular performance uh, degradation during the long term permanence in space. We have got uh, some interesting uh, 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 experience for the short term because we, we repeated this experiment, we, we did this experiment last year during a taxi flight. So now we have uh, a very short term uh, behavior and now we are collecting the data for the long term. So we will have the complete view. Okay. So uh, the result will be a quantitative functional evaluation of the performance of the upper limb and this will allow us to study the effect of countermeasures. We know that uh, astronauts are using countermeasurement, or making exercises using your yacht spin and everything, all the, the, the fitness tools. But uh, uh, when I do some exercises, uh, I'm an engineer, and uh, from a Galilean point of view, I have to measure. Uh, it is not enough to, that, that somebody tell me, well, I feel better. I don't care if you feel better. I want to measure how you feel better. Otherwise, I do not know if the protocol you are doing <coughs> is correcting and is giving you your functional uh, behavior. This is particularly true on, on the air for the rehabilitation purposes. When you are making an exercise, then I have to measure if your strength is really uh, progressing. And of course, all these things will be helpful also for optimization of constructive criteria in the design of orbital modular devices. This is astronaut Roberto Vittori, an Italian astronaut, which flew last year with the Marco Polo mission on a TM-34 taxi flight to the station. What you see is the Russian segment inside. And you can see Roberto face, which is uh, a little bit uh, fat, and he is, is there a pointer? Or? No, no, no. Okay, what you see here is uh, the, what is called the hand grip dynamometer. This hand grip, uh, uh, well, another sample of this hand grip we developed to NASA in the barter agreement between ESA and NASA in 2000 as a part of, uh, thank you, as part of HRF. The human resource facility. And uh, okay. you see here the hand grip and uh, uh, the computer and then uh, a lot of uh, other ancillary equipment here. Here we have Edview while it's performing uh, in the mock up on ground the baseline uh, data collection. Uh, here you see the hardware. And an instrumented glove, you will see better. He is now uh, actually is executing a virtual launch of a virtual ball. So, this is the hardware, uh, the hand grip, the pinch force dynamometer, the set of uh, hand grip and the pinch and the electronic, uh, electronic interface. And here you can see the globe. This is an instrumented globe with uh, 15 degrees of freedom, and uh, we, we can measure the belting angles of the individual phalanxes. And then we have an inertial platform, an inertial tracking system on the wrist in order to reconstruct the position of the hand in the space. So we can reconstruct in any time. <coughs> Uh, the, kin the kinematic of uh, the end, and of, of the, of also the individual fingers. 
this is the entire system set up with the laptop and the, uh, the, the timer <coughs> object when executing the uh, manipulation and grasping uh, expert uh, exercise, uh, the glove, the wrist electronic box, the hand grip, and the pinch force diagram. <coughs> so <coughs> the hand grip has a capability up to 1000 Newton. And uh, we well, have to have an idea uh, well, uh, a very strong person can reach up to 800 newton. An astronaut typically reaches uh, 400, 500 newton. Then we have a pinch force nanometer. Uh, this is used to measure isometric force uh, on key style pinching. <coughs> and then we have uh, the software. And here you can see how it is used for the uh, isometric force and the isometric force uh, while pinching. So this is a, a, preci a precision uh, exercise in force. Uh, just to give you the, an idea of the importance of this, uh, uh, this, this type of uh, protocol, uh, think when, when you have to uh, to adjust the uh, plumbing in your uh, in your house. And most of the times you don't see what you do. You just look, then you take your tools and you start doing. But you have no visual feedback. Hmm. And this is just to say you have to apply sometimes some precision uh, movement, but you have no visual feedback. You can only count on proprioceptive just on your sensory motor uh, uh, transducers that you have on your hand. So uh, the same applies to an astronaut when he is doing an extravehicular activity. He has a very, a very short field of view. So he has to do many things without viewing what he's doing. So it is quite important to understand how a precision uh, exercise of force is altered by microgravity condition. So this is the instrumented globe with the sensors and the uh, inertial tracking system. Oh, oh, both the uh, sensors on the globe and the uh, inertial tracking system has been developed by our company using maps. So micro mechanical and electronic system. <coughs> so there the, uh, some uh, protocols that are going to be used. Uh, they are driven by flight software, so the astronaut has only to follow the, uh, the instruction. Uh, there is a selection among the, the four different protocols. Then the execution of the protocol with visual and textual uh, Direction, the acquisition of data and the logging of uh, uh, remarks and uh, feedback. Here you can see a typical example of, of, of what the astronauts see. This is the, the mask. And you know that the mask of the, an experiment has to be done according to certain NASA uh, 57,000 procedures and so on. Uh, so the colors, the aspect, the general layout has to be uh, done according to the rules. And uh, here you see uh, the, the execution of the protocol of force. Uh, basically, he is requested to stay within, within a certain window. Okay. So there are, <coughs> we had some ground session uh, for the astronauts on what we call the baseline, baseline data collection. And then uh, we had a session on uh, Station and uh, we have uh, three different sessions during one uh, increment, uh, which possibly will become six uh, different sessions. So we will have uh, a certain amount of data during the entire mission of the fire. <coughs> one of the experiments is called MICE, it is manipulation activity in space. And uh, well, we know that according to the, the theory, any grasping movement is combined by two uh, main components. One is the transport 
component, and the other one is the manipulation components. If I if I think to, the, to that glass, that uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, what I and uh, I think I want to catch it. Well, in my brain starts a motor control program, which tell me approximately how much should I open my my fingers. Uh, how far should I approach it? How should I decelerate when I reach it? And how should I readapt? And which force I, I, I have to apply according to its mass and the possible weight? All these aspects are already in my program. Uh, <coughs> in space, we have uh, <coughs> an alteration of this situation because we do not have gravity, so the entire uh, biomechanical part is changing, is altered. And uh, this is very close to what happens on the ground uh, during rehabilitation. For example, if I uh, had a, a problem with my arm, uh, if I had uh, some uh, surgery intervention, uh, then I have to restart. Or if I had an artificial arm, I have to restart. And I have to restart my, my job. So if I understand how it is done in, in microgravity, I can do that in on the ground. Uh, uh, I have a par paradigma. Uh, we have in space normal people in a disabled environment. On the earth, we have disabled people in a normal environment. If we apply this paradigma, uh, I define it with uh, Dr. Pastacal in Bastille. Uh, we can solve the problems using space as a platform. We can solve a lot of problems. And we are actually using the protocol in, clinic, in clinical uh, uh, life. <laughs> so, this is uh, one protocol of uh, reaching and grasping. Uh, what is important is the, the acceleration, the, the way I open the fingers and this type of thing. <laughs> so basically the astronaut has to start from sternum and then uh, he has to take the measure. I mean he has to go there, try to reach without touching and then coming back. And then grasping effectively. Okay, so this is the, the way how the protocol is executed. And uh, what, what do you make, what do we measure? We measure the acceleration profile and we measure the grip attraction. And uh, well, for uh, people working in, in uh, uh, this uh, in this area, what we are looking at is to this specific peak which uh, represents the opening, the maximum opening of the and uh, also to the deceleration uh, process while the, the, the object is going to be reached. Because uh, when we approach that, we go straight, but then we decelerate when we are very close, and then we readapt our, the size of our grasp. This is well-known process by Jean Leroux, and uh, so understanding this process, understanding this acceleration profiles and opening and grasping uh, is going to help us a lot for uh, rehabilitation process. Another experiment is for the imaging. It's an imagery of object motion affected by gravity in null gravity uh, experiments. Uh, basically, the astronaut is asked to think you are in the space. Okay. Now, think to be on the earth and launch a, a ball, which you do not have, but you have to think that you have a ball. You have to launch to have it bouncing to the, uh, to the ceiling and then you have to catch it. So everything is imaginary. Uh, and then we have to do the same time, the same, the same thing thinking as he has to be in the space. The same protocol is applied on the earth, and now the conditions are reversing. 
So in this way, uh, we have a, an idea, and we can get a lot of ideas on uh, uh, how the, uh, the, the um, representation of the environment, and in particular of the gravity, affects the, the mechanism of the control, and affect the mental imagery of uh, an intercepted task. And uh, this will help also in uh, setting up uh, virtual uh, training during rehabilitation purposes. So I already described uh, how the protocol is, is executed. <coughs> he is doing many trials. He is starting from this position and then uh, he Launch the ball and get again. And we are looking to this movement with the inertia platform, and uh, we are also looking, you can see here, this is the, the starting point, then we have the various components of the rotation, we have, he's doing this, this rotation, rotation and uh, of, uh, uh, of opening while he's launching. And then uh, he's uh, going to catch the ball. And we have the acceleration when he's catching the ball. <coughs> okay, another, uh, another protocol is done with Kiro. Kiro is through health investigation for the use of availability, and it is done basically on uh, isometric force measurement. As I said, the hand is an organ undergoing a uh, uh, significant stress and fatigue especially during extravehicular activity, and uh, for this, NASA asked us to provide the data of the astronaut, and of course we are more than glad to share the scientific uh, information with other colleagues. Uh, <coughs> okay. Uh, the, the protocol basically consists in uh, uh, ex accepting the maximum voluntary contraction, he has to accept the maximum voluntary contraction, then automatically is guided, guided in 25%, 50%, and 70% of his maximum uh, uh, force. But with one uh, uh, particular point, he is doing, he's starting making his force uh, for 8 seconds, looking to the windows. Let me see if I have. So, he is exacting his thoughts, and he knows he has to stay within this window, because this has been calculated automatically, and he is going to stay here for 8 seconds. Okay. Then, at this point, and he, he, he can see what, what, what's happening. At this point, he does not see anything more. He loses the, the visual feedback. So, he has no more visual feedback, and he, he can count only on proprioceptive. So you lose an important sensory motor uh, element. And it's clear. He is uh, here underestimating his faults during the blind period. And then the visual feedback is applied again. So this is a, a shift between visual feedback and proprioceptive. And he tries to recover, but uh, then collapse. Because he's, he's becoming tired. But it is also important to, to, to see how fast he, 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 he reacts because it, this gives an indication of uh, his attempt, level of attention. This is especially done with uh, uh, pinch force uh, measurement because pinch is a precision task. It's not a, an aggressive task. Okay. And here in precision task, this is uh, really the visual feedback is extremely important. So this has an impact on operation. When uh, <coughs> anybody has to perform a precision task, the visual feedback is fundamental. We cannot rely only on proper safety. So this uh, gives some important inputs for uh, the uh, extravehicular activities. OK, this is uh, an interesting uh, set of data. Uh, taken during the Victoria mission. This is a very short term, this is 10 days. But it is extremely important because this gives us uh, two, two fundamental points, that in 10 days there is not practically 
no difference in uh, uh, capabilities uh, of the arsenal in terms of maximum force. But this gave us uh, a lot of idea on what's happening during the days. This is the sea space motion uh, effect. So uh, this is the great big gradient during the days, and then it is recovering again. And we got, of course, confirmation of, of his behavior during the days and making the interview to the, to the astronauts. Now, what we are looking, of course, is uh, during the six months in orbit, uh, how this maximum value is changing. And uh, we know that we, it will change, but uh, we have to see how the degradation of performance is. This. And uh, there are some a different school which says that uh, there is no degradation because they are using a lot of their, their hands. So they are making a lot of uh, experience and they are keeping their muscles uh, active. But uh, well, this is one of the purposes of this. Another interesting point I'm going to close to, to conclude is a, a, another interesting finding which we found and we confirmed in the theory. Uh, in, on the Earth, our frequency is around 4, four Hz and up. Uh, so the motor control system activates uh, the way we, we, we push, the way we, 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 we get. Uh, in orbit, it is reduced at 2.5 Hz. And this has been confirmed on different subjects. This is because, of course,